the day that your sins were covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. Lord, we thank you this morning for your love, for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for eternity, God. Lord, that you have given us a promise, Lord, of eternal life, Lord, to everyone who trusts in you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we have gathered here this morning for one purpose, and that's to bring glory and honor to your name. For, Lord, your name is above every name. At the mention of your name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. And, Lord, in this service this morning, we pray that you would have your way through every song that is sung, through every word that is spoken, Lord. May it all be done to bring glory and honor to your name. And we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. There is still victory in the name of Jesus.
thanks, yes. A new world, sis. Oh, yes. Behold, all things are new. Ever since that happy day. A new world since the Lord saved me. I can't explain the way I feel without a doubt. I know it's real, there's glory in my soul. The hallelujahs roll. Though earthly friends may turn me down, I'll still retain the peace I found I'm in. A new world since the Lord saved me. Yes, I'm in. A new the Lord saved our soul. He's given us a new beginning and it's because of the grace of God. Oh, grace, grace, oh, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, praise you may be seated the choir is ministering in song right now we are standing on holy grounds as i walk through the door I sensed his presence And I knew this was a place Where love abounds For this is the temple Jehovah God abides here On holy ground, sing a choir. We are standing on holy ground.
His presence. There's joy beyond all measure. And at His feet, sweet peace of mind can still be found. If you have a need, I know He has the answer. Just reach out and claim it, for we are standing. for the reading of God's Word. This morning we are in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and I will be reading verse 5 through 13. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 13, the Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. 
But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you lift your hands toward heaven one more time, and let's pray for his anointing upon this message. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you this morning. We ask God that you will open up our heart and our ear, Lord, to receive your word, to receive your message of truth. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, that our lives may be changed forever. Lord, by the power of your spirit around these altars. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' Jesus name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. This morning is my fifth message in the series entitled The Power of Prayer. And as I have been preaching over these last several weeks, I believe that prayer is essential to our church. I believe prayer is essential to our everyday life because when people pray according to the will of God and according to the word of God, those prayers have the power to move the hand that has created this world and everything that is within it. Over the course of about eight weeks I am preaching on the subject of prayer. Different areas in our life and in our church where prayer is important. Already I have talked to you about the subject of praying with other people. Praying in agreement. Prayer for salvation. Two weeks ago I preached on the subject of prayer for laborers in the field. And later in this series of messages I will be talking about the prayer for healing. The prayer for anointing of the Holy Spirit and the prayer for deliverance. But this morning, with the Holy Spirit's help, I want to preach to you on the subject of the prayer for lost souls. By a show of hands, how many of you are praying for a lost loved one that God would bring healing into their lives? Nearly every hand in the sanctuary went up at that question. I want to share with you a story this morning from the Gospel of Luke about a rich man who died and went to hell. And although he was spending eternity in hell, this same individual had a burden and an anguishing prayer for lost souls to be saved because he did not want them to come to that horrible, dreadful place that the Word of God calls hell. In Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31, the Bible tells the story. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. 
And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, although one rose from the dead. In order for us as a church and as individuals to effectively pray for lost souls, first of all, we must have a vision to reach lost souls. We must have a vision to reach out to the lost. We need a vision for rescuing those who are lost in their sin from the eternal destination toward hell. Now, some may ask, why is a vision so important? It's very simple. The Word of God tells us in Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 that where there is no fish the people perish but what concerns me today in the church world is that I am afraid the church in general has grown complacent with where we are now I understand that today we are in the midst of a pandemic and there is a lot of sickness going on in the community and around the state and nation and we must be careful in our outreach efforts but church at the same time we must find a way to get this gospel message outside of the four walls of this sanctuary to get this gospel out so that people will hear the truth of God's word that a change will be made in their life that the people will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that the Lord will add to the church daily the souls that are being saved through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit we must have a vision about the church. Now, I'm not talking about a vision of this so-called American feel-good Christianity that we see being proclaimed today, but I'm talking about a vision for a genuine work and a move of God throughout the church today. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this day and age, there is a message of, of carnal Christianity. This message is deceiving people by the thousand and possibly the millions. And a majority of people today who claim to be a Christian have not even repented of their sin. They've not even turned away from their sinful lifestyle. They have not considered to repent of their sin and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They're standing on sinking sand and they become such an easy prey to the snares of the enemy and they're caught up to believing this message of false carnality and it's made our way into our churches and into our church pulpits. See, the very reason for existing as a church and as a ministry of the gospel is so that we, as people of God, may bring out the true message of the gospel to show clearly what is written down in the word of God that we should not sow to the flesh, but instead we must sow to the Spirit of God. We must have a vision and let God open our hearts as we open the Word of God and pray that God will lead us all by the power of His anointing. Because without his anointing, it's not going to work. We must have his power. Why? Because he's the one that strengthens us. He's the one that enables us to do the work that he has called us to do. A lot of the people in the church world today, they're deceived into believing that they are eternally secure in their salvation, regardless of how they live their life. And as a result, we see more and more people that are becoming totally shipwrecked in their faith. And so what I want to ask them is this. If I am eternally secure in my salvation, regardless of what I do in life, regardless of what actions that I commit, then anything is permissible. And that church is what is causing the problems that we're seeing take place in our world today. If there is no absolute truth, is there, if there is no absolute moral, then anything becomes acceptable. They're turning the grace of God into loose living. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. See, we're afraid of offending people, and so pastors are no longer preaching the truth of God's Word. We're no longer addressing the issues that are being uh, taking place in the world today that's caused by sin. 
And a lot of the attitude of people is this. They say, well, a little sin is not going to hurt. After all, I've been saved. All my sins from the past, the present, and the future are forgiven. What are you saying? Are you saying that, yes, I gave my heart to God, but I'm planning to go back out and sin tomorrow? No, sir, it doesn't work like that. Jesus told the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, go and sin a little bit more. No, he didn't say that. He said, go and try not to sin. No, he didn't say that either. He said, go and sin no more. No more. It is possible. We can do that. Yes, people make mistakes. But when we make mistakes, we go to the cross of Calvary and we repent. We ask for his forgiveness. We ask for his blood to wash away every sin. And the word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. A lot of times in church worlds today, we forget that holiness is a requirement of God. Holiness is not based upon an outward appearance, but holiness is based upon what's on the inside. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that brings about holiness within our life. But so many times we forget that it is a requirement by God. But my prayer and my heart's desire is that God would begin to do a work in our heart and soul, that people's lives would be changed, that their blinded hearts would become open to the truth of God's word, that we would cry out to the Lord for the truth of his word that cuts off our flesh and lays us open before God that God may wash away every sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within our life. That's where the change takes place. When it comes to the idea of salvation, a lot of people are today, they're told that if they have believed if they have repeated a simple prayer that that's all that's needed and all is well with their soul. But church, the word of God declares no such teaching. In fact, just the opposite. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, the Bible says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. See, holiness must characterize our lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, for God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And again in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker in the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. When you look at 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 14 through 16 he says as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for I am holy. Church that's the message that the word of God has been trying to proclaim to the church for over 2,000 years Whatever you did in the past, it makes no difference. Whatever your lifestyle was before you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it makes no difference. Why? Because God is no respecter of person. He's not going to treat one individual with a particular past any different than someone else. But when God makes a change in your life, he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And you have a decision to make that you're going to walk away from that old lifestyle, that you're going to flee the lustful relationship, that you're going to flee from the things of this world, that you're going to put away your alcohol, you're going to put away your smoking, you're going to put away your illicit lifestyle, you're going to surrender your will to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And when God makes a change, he does what no other power in this earth can do. He can turn a sinner into a saint. He can raise you up out of sin and give you everlasting life through the precious blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. Don't be confused by the things that's going on in this world. 
Just because it is legal does not mean that the Word of God allows it. In Galatians chapter 6, the Bible gives us a warning from God concerning false teachings in this world. And God would have us to understand not to be deceived by the false message of carnality, no matter what is being said in this world today. In other words, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to your flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. It doesn't matter, church, how many professions of faith you have made in your life. It doesn't matter what church you go to or whether if you don't go to church at all, if your life has not been forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you cannot enter into the gates of heaven. You cannot mock God. God is no respecter of persons. Every one of us, we must allow ourselves to be broken, to be mended, to be molded and reshaped according to the will and the word of God. As we pray for lost souls to be saved, there must be some tears. There must be some agony. There must be some anguish. Oftentimes when people repent of their sin, they begin to shed tears of sorrow. They shed tears of remorse because they are broken over their sinfulness against God. When was the last time that you became broken? over a lost loved one who needs to know Jesus Christ? When was the last time, church, that you began to weep before God because of a lost son or daughter? When was the last time that you had no desire to eat and you could not sleep because all you could think about was what can I do to get them to understand the Word of God? When was the last time that we began to weep and pray and fast and call into God in prayer over a lost soul? Brokenness always gets the attention of God. In Psalms chapter 51, verse 17, David prayed and said, A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. In other words, God's not going to ignore. If you come before God broken, if you come before God in agony, if you come before God in complete anguish and sorrow, God is not going going to ignore you. He sees every tear that is shed. You see, there needs to be more than just a concern, but there needs to be a brokenness. There needs to be some anguish over people that we know that if they do not repent of their sin, if they do not get their life under the precious blood of Jesus Christ, they will spend eternity in hell. Do we really know the difference between being concerned and having anguish. When people are concerned, they have knowledge of the problem. When people are concerned, they may spend some time talking about the problem. When people are concerned, they may think about the problem quite often. When people are concerned, they may even pray about the problem if they have some time. But when there is some anguish, when your heart becomes broken about the issue, when there is some anguish, you begin to weep in agony before the Lord. When there is some anguish, you begin to spend some time in prayer and fasting, and you may go for days without food, and you're sacrificing your time and energy, and you keep on praying until you get an answer. You keep on praying until the answer comes through. See, when you have a concern about a lost individual, a lot of times we just put them on the church prayer list. When we have a concern about a lost soul, we may invite them to church. When we have a concern about them, we might talk to our pastor about that individual. But when you have a burdening anguish for a lost soul, you begin to lose your appetite. You begin to weep over their soul. You begin to cry. You begin to pray day and night. And you begin to fast. You begin to plead the blood of Jesus Christ upon their life and you pray until you get the answer. You pray until you see them pray through. You pray until you can't pray anymore and you say God I've done all I can do. I just pray God that you'll get their attention and draw them by the power of your spirits. What about concern versus anguish within the church? 
What if we had some passion and anguish for those who were lost in sin? What if we as a church we began to spend some time in prayer every day for the lost? What if we began to pray and fast as a church? What if we called their name before the Lord? What if we came early before church and we began to pray and to seek the face of God and plead the blood of Jesus Christ upon their lost soul? What if we were the first one to come to the altar and the last one to leave? What if the service was over but we still haven't got the victory yet? What would happen if just two or three people would just get together and began to pray over lost souls and began to fast and pray and tarry waiting upon the Lord? You see, it's not the will of God that they die in their sins and spend eternity in hell. Why? Because these are the very people that Jesus came into this world to save. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When we know of a lost soul, and when we have a vision and a desire for that soul to be saved, and when we have become broken, and we have become literally an emotional wreck, and we begin to take it to God in prayer, we must pray with confidence. We must pray with an expectation that our prayer for the salvation of their soul is going to be answered. In Luke chapter 16, verse 27, we see the story about a rich man who died and he went to hell. He, but he had a burden to pray that God would send someone to reach out to his family. A man dying and going to hell was praying for souls to be saved. See, God always works in response to people's prayers. We as a church and individuals need to pray for the lost that's around us. Every day we find ourselves surrounded by people who have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We may find others that have heard the gospel but are nowhere near the understanding nor accepting the message. And so the question is, are we praying for them? Are we witnessing to them? Are we reaching out to them? Has it ever occurred to us as a church that prayer is the key that opens the eyes of those who do not know the gospel to the love of Jesus Christ? Most of us work in a secular job setting. I work in a courthouse. There's people every day with lawyers and, and other attorneys and people coming in that's serving community service. There's times that I have an opportunity to talk to them. Some of the people that we see coming in to serve in community service, they've been in church. Some of them I used to take to church on a church bus, and, and throughout the years of time they grew up and they quit going to church, and, and they started hanging around the wrong kind of people. They got in trouble. They got messed up on drugs. They got involved in alcohol. They got involved in other things, and now their, their life is a mess. But church, we've got to continue to pray for them. They're still a soul. And unless God saves them, unless they repent, unless they ask God to forgive them of their sin, they will spend eternity in hell. What if, what if you, you were around someone all the time, you talked to them all the time, and yet the, when they died and they went to hell, they began to question and they said, if only so-and-so would have only told me about this gospel message. If they had not given up on me too soon. I know my life was a mess. I know I told them I didn't want to go to that church. I know I told them they were too old-fashioned. But why did they give up on me? I wish they would have kept on nagging. I wish they would have kept on telling me about Jesus. Hell is full of people today that's crying out, asking God if they'll just give them one more chance. One more chance. If nothing else, let someone hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we pray, we need to pray with the word of God as our foundation. Don't just pray whatever our heart's desire is. 
but we must pray according to the word of God. In Psalms chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, the Bible says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. We must pray according to the word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, but just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Holy Spirit, as we pray for lost souls to be saved. Church, we must make every effort to reach out to them. If we cannot reach them ourselves, we must send somebody who can. Send someone to be a missionary. Send someone that can tell them about Jesus. You see, this rich man that died and went to hell, he wanted to send out a missionary. And his reason was because he did not want his family to die and go to hell and experience the torments and the flames, the fire in hell. He saw the need of people to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, Verse 13 through 17, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Church, we must be praying for lost souls, that they will repent of their sin, that they may be reached with the glorious gospel of Jesus before it's too late. They must be made aware of the realities of eternity. They must be made to know without any doubt that there is a glorious place called heaven that is very real. But also there is another place that has all of the agonies and the torments of hell. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 8, the Bible says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I want you to pay close attention here to this eighth verse. It says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The only ones that can enjoy this eternal life that is written of in the Word of God are those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the ones who have been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Because the reality is this, church, if their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're not going to see the streets of gold. They're not going to see the gates of pearl. They're not going to see their precious loved ones that have died saved by the grace of God ever again. My pastor, every time he would preach a funeral, he would proclaim to the crowd of people that would be gathered, he says, if you're saved by the grace of God, then as you walk by the casket, it's just a, a see you later. It's just a so long until we meet again. 
But he also said a message to those who did not know Jesus Christ. He said, as you walk by this casket, take one long look at your loved one because that's the last time you will ever see them. We must make people aware of the reality of eternity. That if they are not right with God, they will not spend eternity with Jesus Christ. We must continue to pray. We must continue to reach out. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, the Bible speaks about what takes place for those who do not know Jesus. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There is going to be people from every generation, from every nationality, from every walk of life, from every language that will one day stand before Jesus Christ and want to enter into heaven. But they will be turned away. And the people are going to reply, but we have done many works in your name. We have been in your presence. And the Lord is going to say, I tell you, I know you not. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And the Bible says that those people will be cast into the lake of fire, the unquenchable fires of hell and eternal torment. They will be weeping. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We must pray that people may be made aware of the reality of eternity. But church, when we pray, and when we keep on fasting, when we keep on believing for God to bring people to an altar of prayer, when we continuously pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to do a work in someone's life, when God answers your prayer, you have a responsibility. As in every circumstance, when God answers prayer, our responsibility to Him is to praise Him. When you have prayed for your lost loved one to repent, and the day finally comes when, when, when that prayer is answered, and God saves their soul by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, your responsibility, church, is to praise God and thank Him for bringing that individual to the cross of Calvary. I want to tell you, you've never seen a praise break until you see some mom or dad that's been praying for many years for God to save their son or daughter to come back to the cross of Calvary for their forgiveness of sin. You've never seen a praise break of an individual that God has literally snatched from the gates of hell as they repent of their sin and God turns their heart and life around. Why? What's it going to do? It's going to put a song in your heart at the midnight hour when God saves a soul from sin. That's the reason to shout about. That's a reason to rejoice. That's a reason to run for victory. That's a reason to leave for joy. When God sets a sinner free, the Bible says even the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that comes home to know Jesus. I wonder what would happen in the sanctuary this morning if we would begin to praise Him. I wonder what would happen today if we, if, if we would just begin to praise God for what we're praying for. Have you ever thought about that? Praise Him for what you're praying for. What are we praying for? Some of us are praying for healing. Praise Him for that healing. You may have got a bad doctor's report this week. The doctor may have given you so much longer to live. The doctor may have said something about a family member of yours that your family member doesn't have much longer to live. And you're praying for God to bring healing. You're praying for God to bring deliverance. What you need to do is just begin to praise God anyhow. Praise Him for the prayer. What do we praise Him for? We praise Him that if we're praying for healing, we know in the Word of God, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We praise him for healing, because in his word he says we are healed. What else are we praying for? 
Some of us are praying that God would bring provision. Let's praise Him for that provision. We can praise Him for that promise. For our God shall supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so church, this morning, I'm talking to you about praying for the salvation of lost souls. So what we must begin to do is praise Him because He is the Redeemer. He is the Savior. He is the one who came to give life and life more abundantly. The Word of God says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Is anybody redeemed here this morning? Is anybody here redeemed this morning? I said, is anybody here redeemed? Are you redeemed? Are you excited about the grace of God? Are you encouraging someone else to come to know Jesus Christ? Can we stand across the sanctuary? Can we stand? I want to encourage you, church. We sometimes do not see the answer because we do not praise Him enough. I know that's a very bold statement, but it's true, and we know it. Sometimes we're praying, and all we want to do is just, we just say, Lord, well, this is my need, this is my circumstance, and we go back to our seat, and we don't praise Him. We go back, and we never lift up our hand. What would happen if someone would just stand to their feet and shout, Lord, I just want to thank you that the answer's on the way. I believe in your word. I stand on that truth. I stand on that name. That's above every name. I stand on that promise. I hold on to that promise in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Church, don't wait till God blesses. Praise Him now. Don't wait till He brings a healing. Praise Him now. Don't wait till He provides. Praise Him now. Praise Him now. We don't see the answer yet in the physical, but we see it by faith. The answer's on the way. We're going to praise God anyhow. We're going to leap for joy anyhow. We're going to run for the victory anyhow. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. Don't wait till the battle is over. Don't wait till the victory is won. Why? Listen to me. Listen. Whatever God said in his word, whatever God's promised in his word, it is done. He said on the cross, it's finished. That means the healing is there. The victory is there. The battle's won. The battle doesn't have to go on any longer. Hold on to that promise. The battle's finished in Jesus' name. Hallelujah to your name. <laughs> oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We stand on that promise. Church, can you lift your hands across the sanctuary? Let's just take some time and praise Him. Whatever need you're going through, if you want to come to the altar, if you want to stay at your seat, but praise Him. Call unto Him. He is worthy of the praise. He is worthy of the glory. He is worthy of the honor. If you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost, just begin to praise Him. Thank Him for that anointing. Thank Him for that power. If you need salvation, if you need God, to wash away your sin. Come to this altar and thank Him that forgiveness is yours in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I believe the Holy Spirit is here this morning asking a question. Is there anybody here that has a reason to praise me? Is there anybody here that remembers when I made provision for you? Will you open up your mouth and begin to praise my name? Is there anybody here that remembers when you had a bad doctor's report and I brought healing into your life? Do you remember what I did? Do you remember the healing? Would you open up your mouth and praise him? Church, don't let someone else shout your praise. Don't let someone else steal your praise. Don't let some old rock of this world steal your praise. But it's time we shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It's time that we shout out with a voice of praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He has redeemed us by the power of God. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. You worship God. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. He inhabits the praises of His people. He inhabits the praises of His people. What are you praying for? Do you have a lost loved one? Do you have a lost son or daughter that you want to see come to know Jesus Christ? Begin to praise God for salvation. Thank Him that the answer's on the way. Hallelujah.